How are you? We're all doing great. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Uh, let's get ready and pray at this time. Father in heaven, how we thank you for blessing us to be together for this Bible study in Jude. We ask you, O oh God, to cover our study. We lift up to you, Sister Foster, and the challenge that she's facing. We ask for your victory in her life. We also ask God to touch Sister Jackson as she ministers to her husband and family. Give her strength, O oh God, as she cares for this man whom she has loved and lived with for most of her life. God, we also ask you to touch others who are on the prayer list, our loved ones, and then God, we ask you to even uh, restore what this storm has damaged and allow people to be uh, comfortable in the midst of all of this. We thank you for this word today that will bless our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, saints, just a quick reminder, quick reminder uh, for those who are on with us that uh, we will be switching Bible studies starting on June the 17th to, uh, not June, September 17th to Tuesdays. Bible study will be on Tuesdays at noon and 7 p.m. so that we can accommodate those who want to be in person and Wednesday night live at the same time. Uh, we will not have Bible study next week nor the week following. And so uh, please enjoy your break, holiday, and uh, don't eat too much barbecue, all right? <laughs> uh, today we are in Jude chapter uh, 1. There's only one chapter, verses 8 through 11. I remember that the theme of Jude is to stay faithful to the faith. Stay faithful to the faith. That's the theme of the book. Today's passage is going to be uh, Jude verse 7, I mean verse 8 through 11, so let's go there now. Jude chapter 1, I keep saying that, verses 8 through 11, and I'm going to back up and read from verse 5 down to 11, okay? And for those who might be watching this later, remember that we are using the Christian Standard Bible uh, as our text. And we are using Dr. Thomas Constable's notes on Jude as our background study material. If you are not in study group, we want to encourage you to join a study group. And we also thank God for those who are studying outside of Bible study time in your groups so that you're ready. Okay, all right, let's look at our passage. Today's passage is verse 8 through 11, but we'll start reading in verse 5. Now, I want to remind you all that you came to know all these things once and for all, that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not keep their own position but abandoned their proper dwelling. He has kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed sexual immorality and perversions and served as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. In the same way, these people, relying on their dreams, defile their flesh, reject authority, and slander glorious ones. Yet when Michael the archangel was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body, he did not dare utter a slanderous condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme anything they do not understand. And what they do understand by instinct, like irrational animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, they have plunged into Balaam's error for profit, and have perished in Korah's rebellion. Amen. God bless you. Let's look at this passage and what it means. Remember that the theme of Jude is to do what? Stay faithful to the faith. Stay faithful to the faith. So in this uh, section of Jude, uh, in this pericope of Jude, uh, the key thought, here's the key thought, and this is in the notes, if a man is persistently blind to spiritual values, death to the call of God, and rates self-determination as the highest good, then a time will come when he cannot hear the call he has firm, but is left to the mercy 
of turbulent of the turbulent instincts to which he once turned in search of freedom. Okay. So in this passage today, what we're going to learn about is what happens when people ignore God's call and decide to live for themselves. Okay. There are three errors in this text that we will explore. And the three errors of the false teachers uh, that Jude points out is rebellion. Uh, let's start first. Lust, rebellion, and irreverence. Lust, rebellion, and irreverence. We've looked at those, but Jude says in verse 8 that the same way that the false teachers fall prey to lust, rebellion, and irreverence, now uh, uh, there's an, three other errors that enter in for those who are uh, in apostasy, for those who are rejecting what God says in his word. And the first error is they rely on their dreams, defile their flesh, reject authority, and slander verses. The first one is they rely on their dreams rather than God's word. Okay? They are living in a false reality because they're following the arbitrary fancies of their imagination. Okay? They're living in a false reality because they're not clinging to God's word. They have constructed a reality of their own based upon their own imagination. Okay? Anybody have questions for me about that? What's the uh, difference between a dream and a premonition then? Okay, so dreams and premonition. Uh, dreams usually are connected to our subconscious mind. We know from scripture that sometimes God does use dreams to speak to people. But God's primary way of speaking to people is through his word. Problem with dreams and premonitions is that dreams and premonitions are subject to our sinful nature. So if our sinful nature is controlling our dreams and our premonitions, our dreams and our premonition can be uh, prone to error, okay? And that's one of the issues with this, with this group uh, who is rejecting God's truth is they're relying on their own imagination, their own mind. And remember, as we talked about the other day, because of Adam's sin, our minds are tainted, okay? Uh, and as a result, uh, they also are unrestrained in their conduct. We talked about previously three hallmarks of false teachers. One of them was uh, uh, relying on their own mind. A second one was uh, uh, fleshly pursuits. And we're going to see a third one in this text as well. Okay? All right. Then Jude lifts up an example of the most powerful angel not allowing himself to get outside of God's will, but operating in submission to God's will, even when dealing with the enemy. Okay? So when Michael is arguing with Satan, what is he arguing with Satan over and why? Slanderous condemnation. Say it again. Slanderous uh, condemnation. He, he does not make a slanderous condemnation. To the devil about what? Moses' Moses's body. Okay. What would have been the issue with Moses' body? Uh, 
wanted to take it uh, because and bury it, thinking that the the devil probably wanted to take it because that way he could have people idolize it and turn them away from God. And, yes. And uh, the archangel Michael wanted to take it because Moses had done all these uh, great things and so they wanted to properly bury the body. Yes. So who is it that winds up burying, burying Moses' body? What does the scripture tell us? Well, no one really knows where his body is, so I'm going to say that that uh, Archangel won out. Yes. God uses Michael to conceal Moses' body in the ground. If the devil was able to take Moses' body, as you said, and use Moses' appearance as an instrument to lead the people astray, the children of Israel could have been wrecked. Okay? This deals with a phenomenon, spiritual phenomenon that we need to be aware of called uh, familiar spirits, which is when the enemy, the devil, uses the appearance of someone we know deceptively. And you'll see this sometimes when a person dies and a person will say, my mama was right there in the room with me. My daddy was right there in the room with me. Scripture says to be absent from the body is to be where? Present with the Lord. Present with the Lord. And the only time in Scripture that we see somebody come back actually from the dead and speak to people other than Jesus, Lazarus, the widow of Nain's son and Jairus's dog is when Saul calls up Samuel with a, uh, a, a, a medium. And the appearance of Samuel shows up and Saul is still condemned. Okay? Uh, uh, and so this idea that the devil could use Moses' body to deceive the children of Israel, Michael doesn't even, although he's the most powerful of the angels, he doesn't adopt uh, a, a derogatory tone, okay? Because he's operating in submission to God, right? And this is a reminder to us that we have to be careful how we speak. Sister Lewis, you have a question. Go ahead. Yes, I thought um, Moses just went up into the mountains and no one knows. I mean, he just went up there to die. He did. And that, and that we don't know, was he buried? Did he just, you know, was just taken up with the Lord like Enoch? I mean, we don't know because it's not in the Bible, right? Yes, it is. Uh, let's look at something real quick. Let's go to uh, Numbers 20. Okay, let's go to Numbers 20 just for a minute. Numbers chapter 20. And we'll look at what happens to Moses. Okay. And understand, I, I might preach this someday. If I do, uh, I'm going to call it Don't Hit the Rock. Okay. The children of Israel, Moses is leading through the wilderness of Zen. They get to Kadesh. Moses' wife dies and is buried there. So number one, he's dealing with grief. Number two, people start arguing with Moses and Aaron 
because what is the resource that they lack or appear to? Water. No water. Okay. Moses goes with Aaron. They pray to God. God tells them, take the staff. You and your brother speak to the rock, and I'll cause water to come out of it. Moses takes the staff and he hits the rock and basically cusses the people out. He's sick of them. They hmm. sick of him and he's sick of them. Okay? And he strikes the rock twice. And then the Lord says to Moses, because you did not trust him to demonstrate my holiness, you will not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Okay? This is Meribah. We go to Numbers chapter 27. Numbers 27. Because what Moses does in Numbers 20, the Lord says to Moses, go up to the mountain of the Abiram range and see the land I've given you. After you've seen it, you will be what? What's going to happen to him in verse 13? You said in verse 13? Yes. Numbers 27, 13 says what's going to happen to Moses. Oh, Numbers 27. Yes. Not 20. So you went to 27. I'm sorry. I was still in 20. 27, 13. What, what's God tell Moses is going to happen? After you have seen it, you will also be gathered to your people as Aaron, your brothers, was. What does the figure of speech gathered to your people mean? Actually passing away or dying. It means dying. So God tells Moses that he's going to die. After you set up your uh, successor, I'm going to take you out of this world. Okay? And so God takes Moses after he establishes the ministry of Joshua. Mm. And God is the one that hides Moses' body. Mm -hmm. It seems like he went to a, it seemed like he went to a better place than the promised land, though. Well, he does. He does. That's a great point, Mel. He does go to a better place than the promised land, but Moses is not allowed to enter it because of his own disobedience. Which is a word for those of us who are in positions of leadership and responsibility. And that is we cannot allow God's people to frustrate us to the extent that we're disobedient and disrespectful to God. Okay? That's a temptation. And so Michael, in securing and burying the body of Moses, Michael does not adopt a derogatory tone. Okay? He says, and this is a word for us, the Lord rebuke you. Michael does not act in his own authority. He acts in the authority of God. Mm. All right? We track. Second example, something else that's in this text that we need to understand is that Jude is quoting from a non-biblical source, okay? And this book called The Assumption of Moses is not considered scripture. Why is that not a problem? Because it's true to the, to the, to the God's word. Yes, it, it, it does agree with God's word, yes. Why else is this not a problem? Oh, it's no error. Or that it's the testament of Moses? Because the Holy Spirit will sift it and allow it to come forth as truth. Yes. Even though it's non-biblical literature, the Spirit of God that has inspired you to write the epistle guarantees the veracity of the story. Okay? And so the issue is, and I'm going to give you another passage to look at. Let's go to Titus chapter 1 for a moment. 
Titus chapter 1, verse 12. Titus chapter 1, verse 12. Okay. Titus chapter 1, verse 12. Paul is telling Titus about the Cretans that he's doing ministry for and with. One of their own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gut gluttons. What does he say in verse 13? This testimony is true this for this reason. Yes, so rebuke them so that they'll be sound in the faith. So here's Paul quoting a non-biblical source, not scripture, but it's still true. Same thing with Jude quoting the assumption of Moses, which we know is not scripture. It's historical, but it's not inerrant. It's not without error. We don't consider it to be scripture. The early church did not consider it to be scripture, and they did not use it as well. Okay? And so it, it, there are places in the Bible where non-canonical, non-scripture is used as literature. Okay? Is turning the other cheek oh, known as non-biblical too? No, sister, that's biblical. That's biblical. That's in the Bible. Yeah. The question you could is take it and uh, paraphrase. You could take a lot of those verses and paraphrase it, and it you, still makes sense. Probably even more sense. Well, you can, but the issue is I need to understand what the text means to the original audience. I need to understand what the timeless truths are that come out of that text, and then how does it apply to us today? So when we look at the scriptures, we can't decide, I want to use this and I don't want to use that. I like this and I don't like that. I need to understand why God put it in the Bible in the first place and then apply it to my life. Okay? Uh, these people that Jude is talking about, they also practice blatant blasphemy. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Write this down if you didn't already look it up. The person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand since it is evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. These people blaspheme what they don't understand. And we see that in our culture today. Where do we see that today? Some of the prosperity uh, preaching. Prosperity preaching. Okay. That might be an example where else. Uh, many people blaspheme uh, churches, period, because they do not understand how people can be uh, dedicated to worship of Jesus Christ. They blaspheme him. Right. They, they reject Christ, and then they ridicule those who worship him. Okay? Uh, also, so cults. So when you have cults, they have taken God's word and twisted it. Yes. And let's look at something. What does blasphemy mean? It looks like... Go ahead, Mel. Sister Lewis, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, just speaking um, negatively or, or against God. Okay. Blasphemy means rejecting God's truth in speech. Speaking right, again. against <laughs> God's truth. Mm -hmm. So some groups give a piece of truth and a lie. Mm -hmm. 
But anything we add to God's word detracts from it. Anything we add to God's word. You don't need Jesus plus anything else. Anything we add to God, to the gospel, reduces it. And so the difference between that and blasphemy is blasphemy just rejects it out of him. Okay? And the, the, the unfortunate thing about what Jude is saying about these false teachers is they're ignorant and they reject the truth that they don't understand. And that's probably why, and, and, and it's amazing how God just knows everything. In the book of Revelation, I'm, I'm not sure which chapter, I'm not sure if it was the last one or the last book where he says, you can't add anything to it. Yes. Add nothing to it. Absolutely. Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything away from it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The scripture doesn't need to be propped up and stand on something. Right. Okay. The other thing about these false teachers is they are destroying themselves. And what they do is they take the gratification of their flesh. Scripture says if we if we sow to the flesh, we sow destruction. And so what they do understand natural instincts, they allow those natural instincts to destroy them, those natural appetites. Can we think of anybody in the scripture other than the three examples that Jude is going to give us who does this? Somebody who destroys themselves over their natural appetites in the scriptures. Who else can we think of that that applies to? Samson. Judas. Judas. Sam yeah, who else? Judas. Judas, yes. Samson is pursuing pleasure. Judas is pursuing money and possibly power. Anybody else? Well, I have a well could that be David? Because he... Certainly. Certainly. Yep, you're you're right. I thought about David too. Then I said, "Hmm." Where then David, the then David became a man after the Lord's own heart. But you're you're right. You're absolutely right. David was already a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. But he still did what? He he uh, went into the temple and uh, administered things that he wasn't supposed to administer. Oh. That, was, that was Saul. That was Saul. That's mm. all. David takes advantage of Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Saul, because he's impatient, gets out of his lane and administers the sacrifice and is immediately rejected by God. God fires him and leaves him on the job. God decapitates him but leaves him in place as the head of the nation. Without mm. God, without God's power. Okay. One of the things we have to learn is that that submitting to our appetites can destroy us. Mm. And that's and that's one of the things that has happened with this group. Now, Jude is gonna give us three examples. And he starts off talking about these three examples with this word woe. What does woe mean? The opposite of a blessing is doom, a curse. Yes, it's the opposite of a blessing. It's a curse. Okay. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 and 23. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Woe in scripture is always a curse. It's not just a warning. It says that destruction is certain to follow. And so there are three groups that he deals with here, three individuals that he deals with. The first one is Cain. And Cain shows up in the Bible in Genesis chapter four. What is Cain's problem? Yeah. 
Repeat the question. Canaan shows up, Genesis chapter four. And this is a very dense text because he's referencing biblical history. What is Cain's problem? He shows Be arrogance. Pride. I'm sorry. He shows arrogance, malice, and false piety. An example of also unbelief. All right. He's arrogant. Malice uh, towards his brother. Something in the scripture. Abel offers some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And how does the Lord respond to Abel's offering? He accepts it. He accepts his offering. Okay. Cain offers produce to the Lord. Some of the land's produce. How does the Lord respond to Cain's offering? He didn't accept it. Doesn't accept it. What's Cain's response? He was really furious. Right, he's angry. Look at verse seven and tell me in Genesis 4, 7, why does the Lord not accept Cain's offering? Because he didn't do it right. Look at verse seven. It won't be accepted. But if Look you do it right, sin is uh, crouching at the door. Then so what's, what's the problem in Cain's life? What's going on with it? In, in four and seven, if you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It's desirous for you, but you must rule over it. So what's going on in Cain's life? I think there was a rivalry between he and his brother. Does the scripture say that? No, but it proves out later on. Okay. Look at verse 7. What's, what's Cain's problem? He's despondent. What's waiting for, for Cain like a lion to, to destroy him that he's not dealing with? In verse 7. Sin. Sin. Cain's problem is that sin is ruling over him. Crouching right? at the door. Yes. It's it's ruling over him. It's ready to destroy him. He's given into it. And what God says to him is, you need to repent from your sin before me, before you bring your offering to me. Because what Cain has, Cain has his offering in one hand and his appetite in the other hand. Mm. He has his offering in one hand. He has his sin in the other hand. And what Cain is doing is Cain does not have respect for God, but he wants God to respect him. Okay? <laughs> and Cain's problem is that he has the form of righteousness, but his heart is far from God. Okay? And why his name was, uh, why their name was Cain and Abel, uh, Cain and Abel from the beginning because it was supposed to be basically Adam's, a result of Adam's that he sins too? Ah, okay, sister, you make a great point. Adam and Eve sin and sin enters into the world. I'm going to go back and preach that message, I'm scared. And because Adam and Eve sin and sin enters into the world, it affects their children. And so you see sin in the family because Adam and Eve don't deal with it. Now here it comes in a worse way in their children. And what God is telling Cain is repent and I'll accept you.
But what Cain chooses to do instead is to kill the person that reminds him to kill the person who's been accepted because he's been rejected. And God yeah. allowed Cain to kill Abel, the innocent one. Yes. And, and Cain lived. Yes. And God now, knew it was going to happen. For some extra homework, go back and look up what happens to Abel and Cain in the book of Hebrews. What the book of Hebrews has to say about Cain and Abel. God. He also said that blood would be on your hands. Aww. Absolutely. Yeah. So Cain's way is pride. Okay? Uh, he wants God to accept him based upon what he's done, but not based upon his heart. There's a second person in the text. They have gone the way of Cain. They have plunged into Balaam. That's what we call him, Balaam. Balaam in Hebrew, Balaam's Arab for prophet. Who is Balaam or Balaam? And what does he do? And what's his problem? And did anybody look up his story in scripture? Talk now. No, I'm just reading here about Balaam. Okay. Let's go to Numbers chapter 31. Numbers 31. Jude requires some background reading. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, let's back up to Numbers 22 first. Okay, let's go to Numbers 22. What does Balak try to get Balaam to do? Numbers 22. Verse 6. What does he want Balaam to do? He says, please come and put a curse on these people for me because they are more powerful than I am. I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land for I know that those you bless are blessed and those you curse are cursed. What, did, what do they show up with in verse 7? The elders of Moab and Midian departed with fees for divination in hand. They came to Balaam and reported to Balak's words to him. Balaam is a prophet for prophet. He is a P-R-O-P-H-E-T for P-R-O-F-I-T. He's, hmm. he's, he's a prophet for hire. Okay? And, and he said to them, spend the night here and I'll give you the answer the Lord tells me. He takes the money. He takes the money. And when he's asked to put a curse on them, verse 12, God tells him, you're not to go with them. You are not to curse this people for they are blessed. Balaam tells him, go back. Can't go with you. Balaam keeps sending more and more people. Finally, God gives him permission to go, but only do what I tell you to do. But Balaam's problem is, Balaam has already accepted payment when God has told him not to go. He accepts the payment before God tells him not to go. Anybody else see that in the text? And so because he's a prophet for hire, what's his real motivation for spiritual mm -hmm. things? To use it for his benefit, not God's. Yes, to use it for his benefit. This is the era of Balaam. You need to go back and read the whole story. 
Okay. Numbers 22 through verse, Numbers chapter 22 through chapter 25. Okay. So Balaam said, What Judas did? Yes, sister. Same matter. Judas sells Jesus out for money. Balaam is asked to sell Israel out for money. Mm -hmm. So Balaam has two arrows. What are his two arrows? What does he stand for? False religion, greediness, and immorality. All right. Say it again. He was greedy. And He's greedy. False religion, <laughs> leading people into immorality. And leading people into immorality. Balaam stands for two things. Greed and leading other people into sin. Greed and leading other people in the scene. Okay? One of the things we have to be careful about is that we're not in ministry for the money. That we don't do what we do for the Lord for what we can get out of it. The second thing is that we're not in it to draw a crowd for ourselves because we might lead people wrong. Okay? So that's Balaam's arrow. Okay? Then there is Korah. Korah. Okay. Let's go to number 16 real quick. Korah. Numbers chapter 16. What happens in number 16 with Korah? What is, what, what, what's Korah's issue? He, he is rebelling against Moses. Um, he has a grievance against Aaron, and he's angry that he wasn't chosen to be a high priest, I think. All right. So what's his grievance with Moses and Aaron? He wanted more power. He wanted, yeah. to, he wanted to be more than what he was. He wanted to be elevated in status. What does he accuse Moses and Aaron of doing? Exalt themselves and to holiness. Yeah, he, he, he accused them of exalting themselves above the community. And look at Moses' response in verse 4. When Moses hears this, what does he do? He feels down. False base down. <laughs> Scripture says that Moses is the most humble man that ever walked the earth. Okay. Korah says the whole community is holy. Y'all ain't special. Why are you exalting yourself over us? Who was it that put Moses in the position he was in? God. It was God. Okay, God is the one that selects leadership. I had somebody call me the other day because there's a church that's looking for a pastor, and they said, Pastor, the person was talking, we said, We got a whole bunch of HR people in our church. They they can help us with this search. I said, I don't care how many HR people you got in there, I want to know how many you got in there to pray. Because God assigns leadership. God assigns leadership. People don't select leadership. People affirm whom God has selected. And Moses does not put himself as the leader. The minute he tried that, he got ran out of Egypt for 40 years. God calls Moses. <laughs> so they were they were going, they were doing a um trying to do a, a godly purpose or or selection by worldly standards. Yes. By using HR saying. person by using HR personnel. Yes, yes, in that particular instance. But it, it happens all over the place. That we apply worldly standards to spiritual things. And what Korah says is, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like Moses does. Moses ain't special, okay? Moses does not hold himself out as being special, but he's the leader that God has appointed, okay? And so Moses says, Tomorrow we're going to find out. 
And then God takes them through a period of demonstrating who is on God's side and who is not. Okay? Uh, uh, and God causes what to happen to Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? What does God cause to happen to these people? Swallowed the up by opens. the earth. The earth opens up and swallows them and all of their households and all of their stuff because they are in rebellion against who? Moses, God's chosen leader. Yes. And by implication, they're not really just rejecting Moses. Who are they really rejecting? God himself. God himself. Okay. The saints, let me caution us about something. When God establishes leadership, those of us who are in a position to follow <laughs> need to respect what God has done. Those of us who are in leadership need to walk humbly before the Lord and recognize God sets us up and God can take us down. Okay? All right. I, I don't want to dwell on this too long. Somebody will say, Pastor, be arrogant. Okay? <laughs> no, I say we need to pray for our leaders too, that they will stay in the word and they will follow Christ. Yes. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay? Absolutely. So there's three examples of unbelief in this text. What does Cain teach us? What does Cain teach us? To show arrogance, malice, and false love, piety, or the apostasites for example, the example of religious unbelief. All right. Unbelief. What does that's religious unbelief. What does Balaam teach us? What type of unbelief? Compromise. Wasn't right. that Balaam? Era compromise. Yes, yes. What does Korah teach us not to do? Rebellion. Defying, um, defying God's authority. Defying God's authority. So all three of these examples are examples of people who apostatize. Okay, Cain rebels. Balaam, I mean, uh, 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 Cain is arrogant. Balaam is uh, greedy, and Korah just rebellious. Okay, three examples. Mm -hmm of unbelief for us to remind us what not to do. Okay. Who's got questions for me? All right. Let's, let's look at these discussion questions a little bit, Saints, okay? Let's look at these. In the beginning, there are three errors that Jude accuses the false teachers of. What are those three errors? Lust, rebellion, and irreverence. Lust, rebellion, and irreverence. Okay. Let's jump down to question number three. What do these people's perverted views and unrestrained conduct do? Their un their perverted views and their unrestrained conduct. What do they do? It made them dreamers. They were living in arbitrary fancies of their own imaginations. All right. They're living in a false reality that they have constructed. Mm -hmm. okay? And how often have we done that? Wasted time and money and our spiritual energy. Let's jump down to question number seven. Question seven. What do the false teachers last theme? Ever they do not understand. 
whatever they don't understand. Let me ask a different question. What should they do instead? Hey, seek truth. Yes, seek truth, seek instruction. Rather than rejecting it, ask to be taught. Okay? Have the humility to sit under somebody's teaching. Okay? Ask and you shall love. Ask and you shall love. Receive. Receive. Yeah. Absolutely. We had some people come here to argue with us. And I wanted to just pull out my credentials and tell them, but they wanted to argue. And I was like, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to treat you with respect. But I'm not going to get into some argument with you when you're unlearned. Okay? And so we, 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 we have to be careful that we don't fall prey to false realities and people who have an exalted view but haven't studied God's word consistently, systematically, and understanding. Okay? There's some compassion that we need to have there. Okay? What's the outcome of the false teachers understanding? What happens to them? Good afternoon. My name is Denisha and I'm calling from the Patient Business Service at Michigan Medicine. What's the false teachers What's the outcome of what they don't understand? What happens to them? Actually, it's uh, described as slow suicide, gratification of the flesh, fleshy values, and uh, the gospel of the flesh. They've lost all sense of uh, awareness of spiritual things. Yes, I like that. Slow suicide. And it doesn't, the destruction doesn't happen immediately, but it happens surely. Okay. All right. Don't Let's they go you. Don't they go under you reap what you sow? Uh to a degree. To a degree, yes. Because the Bible says if we sow to the spirit, we'll reap spiritual things, we'll reap life eternal. But if we sow to the flesh, we will reap destruction. Okay. What do we say Cain's error was? What was his error? One word. What's his error? Sin. Pride. Pride. It is the sin of pride. Okay. Question number 11. What was Korah's error? Rebellion. Rebellion. Okay. All right. Saints, do you have any questions about Jude, 8 through 11, the three lessons that we learn here. All right, so positively speaking, let's put it this way. You might want to write this down. Okay. Everybody ready? Genuine. Faith is not reading, is not prideful, and is not rebellious. Genuine faith is not greedy, is not prideful, and is not rebellious. Instead, it puts others first, it is humble. And it submits to God's leadership. Okay. All right. Well, listen, I pray this lesson has been a blessing for all of us. And uh, at this time, we're going to close our recording at this time.